Hey there everyone, this is author Anthony Avina and welcome to another episode of the Epicenter Reading Podcast. Uh, this podcast series is where I read my latest novella, uh, Epicenter, um, to you guys. Uh, when we last left off, we finished chapters, chapter 2, sections 4 and 5. So we are on section 6 of Epicenter and we are getting to the nitty gritty part of the zombie outbreak. So, uh, without further ado, here is part six of chapter two of Epicenter. Driving to Fisher Industries, I found myself mystified that the city of Los Angeles seemed to be a desolate and abandoned, as if the apocalypse had already taken hold on the city while I was asleep or something. The streets were bare for the first mile or so as we drove on leaving the radio off and sitting in the car in silence due to the nature of the night. But as we drove on, we began to hear the wailing of sirens, and coming in from the opposite direction was a line of police cruisers and ambulances heading in the direction of the hospital. Jesus, what's going on, Clark? Monica asked, following the trail of emergency vehicles as they passed by. They're heading to the hospital. Things must be getting worse there. We have to be prepared for anything. You're talking like it's the end of times, Clark. You didn't see that guy's lab. He could have been cooking up some chemical agent or biological weapon of some kind for all we know. I need to get to Fisher Industries now before it's too late. He's the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company, babe. He's never going to break his silence if it means the end of his company. We won't give him a choice, I said simply, knowing that I might have to break regulations and get something the hard way. We arrived at Fisher Industries at 11.50 p.m. I still remember that, even to this day. I remember it because in, not, in just 10 minutes, the dawn of not just a new day would be upon us, but a new era as well. Listen to me, Monica, and listen well. I don't like that you're here right now. I don't know what sort of danger is heading our way, and I can't bring you with me into the building. I have to leave you in the car, and I hate it with a passion. I have to go in, but I need to know that you'll stay here and be safe. Clark, I'll stay here. I'm in no condition to be following you to the heart of the beast. Just be careful. Come back to me in one piece, and go get the son of a bitch responsible for this mess. I love you, I replied leaning in and kissing her quickly on the lips. Before she could reply, I opened my door and slammed it shut behind me. I stood outside the car long enough to make sure Monica locked the doors behind me, and then I began running up the steps of the Fisher Industries building, hoping that it wouldn't be too late to stop the madness I had found myself thrust into. Jake met me in front of the building, his gun already drawn and staring at the locked glass doors with a ferocious intensity. His shirt was torn in jagged strips on his body, and his face was splashed with flecks of blood. His hair was a mess, and his face held a grim expression, like that of a war veteran who had just survived an enemy assault. Damn, Jake, what the hell happened? I asked him, drawing my own weapon in reaction to his stance and mood. It's total chaos down at the hospital, Clark. People are tearing each other apart. And every second I was there, I felt like I was in the middle of a horror movie. I don't know what kind of virus or whatever Dr. King injected Kathy and Sal with, but it's spreading fast, and they move and act like freaking zombies. What did headquarters say when he called them? There's no one there answering the phones, Clark. They're all out dealing with the situation at the hospital. It's growing out of control. Headquarters is abandoned? What the hell is going on, Jake? I don't know, but I'm about to shoot these doors and make my way to Mr. Fisher. His security goons have been stalling me for the last 15 minutes, and my patience is wearing thin here. Is Monica safe? She's in the car. We were out to dinner when you called, but I didn't want to leave her alone in case this thing turned sideways. Good thinking. Are you with me on this? Yeah, I'm with you, partner. Let's get some answers. Jake nodded, and together we aimed at the glass doors of the building. 
Above us, a pair of loudspeakers suddenly crackled to life, and Mr. Fisher's voice boomed overhead. Agents, what are you doing here? It's far too late for questioning, don't you think? Mr. Fisher, your security team was seen fleeing the scene of a crime at St. Maria's with the body of Dr. Thomas King. After they left, a biological weapon infected hundreds of people at the hospital, and now the infection is spreading. Now what the hell was Dr. King really researching, and why did you take his body from the hospital? Is he the source of this outbreak? Jake yelled, looking up at the building. Agents, I'm a businessman, and what I do with my property is my business. Not when it's a matter of national security. Now listen here, Mr. Fisher. You will let us in and give us all the information you have on Dr. King and his research, or else we are going to shoot our way in there and take it ourselves. I will not let politics and big business dictate how many people survive this outbreak, I yelled up at the building, finally letting my anger get the best of me and shoving aside the cool and calm demeanor I tried to uphold as an FBI agent. I have every right to defend my property, agents, and I will authorize my security team to take lethal action against you and your partner if you enter the premises. Now leave here at once or else... That was as far as Richard Fisher got. For as he spoke, a loud roar of anger sounded in the room Fisher was speaking from. The roar was filled with rage and a deep hunger that was pretty apparent from the outtake. And I knew that Fisher had just sealed his own fate, and the fate of the city. Get him strapped down! What are you just standing there for? Shoot him in the head or before he gets too loose. What? The other subjects are loose. What did you fucking idiots do? No. No! Before the fallen CEO could say any more, a loud scream filled the intercom, and from above us, the sound of shattering glass was soon followed with the falling debris of a broken window and the pair of twisting bodies locked in a firm embrace. Jake and I quickly ran away from the falling debris and listened with a grimace on our faces as the two bodies la landed with a thud on the cobblestones of the building. Blood sprayed the ground and glass doors, and when we turned, we saw the body of the newly dead Richard Fisher and his recently dead secretary, Miss Bran. Brain matter and blood covered the area surrounding their bodies, and we looked in one on in horror as the last hope for stopping this outbreak quickly faded away. Come on, Clark, let's get in there before Jake began to say... But before he could, a loud roar sounded in the building, and when we looked inside, we came face to face with the end of the world. And I think we have time for the uh, section seven. Uh, section seven. Inside of Fisher Industries, a large group of infected people came bursting from various entry points inside the lobby, and right then and there, I knew that it was a zombie outbreak. Without knowing the technical cause of the outbreak or how they came to be, I knew that this was something out of a horror film, and only by coming to that realization could Monica, Jake, and I survive. Jake, we gotta go now, I yelled, grabbing him by the shirt and pulling him down the staircase leading to my car. I yelled at Monica to open the car, and it was at that point that I heard the shattering of glass and the frantic cries of the undead. I kept my head forward and ran. But I felt tension pulling at my hand. I realized that it was Jake turning around and stopping behind me. His shirt slipped through my hand, and when I turned back, I saw one of the worst sights I'd ever seen. The zombies were manic, strong, and extremely fast. Moving at superhuman speed, the creatures sported pale white skin with black lines running through their dried up veins, and a mixture of red and black eyes. They snapped at the air like they were predators hunting for nourishment, and I could see spittle flying from their mouths. Jake, don't look back, we have to go, I shouted, but it was too late. He stumbled and fell down the rest of the stairs just as I reached the car. I turned and began firing into the horde of creatures, but it was futile. I was running out of bullets, and I had to protect Monica. As the zombies descended on my partner and best friend, I saw the man I had just shot and killed hours earlier, Dr. Thomas King, now zombified and descending on Jake with a savage fury. Before I could aim my weapon, Dr. King tore into the stomach of my best friend, 
and I heard Jake scream in agony as he was torn apart. The sound, the sound of his screams is something I'll never forget for the rest of my life, and it haunts me even to this day. I went to aim my gun at the doctor, hoping to kill him before Jake was killed, but he and Jake were swallowed into the horde of zombies descending on us, and I couldn't find them again. Cursing under my breath, I ran to the other side of the car and jumped into the driver's seat. Holy shit, Clark, what are those things? Monica asked, staring outside her window at the horror beside her. Zombies, Monica. Deadly, ravenous zombies. That bastard Thomas King created a biological weapon, I guess. And now it's spreading fast. We have to get out of the city and fast. What about Jake? He's gone, Monica. They got him before we could get out. She looked at me solemnly, then screamed in terror as a zombie launched itself at our car, cracking her window and nearly knocking the car on its side. I didn't hesitate, putting the car into gear and driving away from the building. Looking into my rearview mirror, I watched in horror as the zombies ran into the city of Los Angeles, overrunning passing citizens and feasting on them. I looked away in disgust and picked up my phone and handed it to Monica, telling her to call the home office while I drove out of the city. The zombies were fast, running behind us and flowing into the streets of the city, spreading the infection further. Monica tried and tried to get through, but the phones were either tied up or dead, and after 20 minutes, we realized that it was too late. Exiting the city and driving towards the high desert of Southern California, we looked back and saw the devastation that was quickly overtaking the city. Dear God, Clark, what are we going to do? I looked at her and shook my head, not sure what was to come next. I stared out my window and saw the end of the world unfolding before my eyes. And there we'll stop it. That was the end of chapter two, actually. Uh, that was chapter two, sections six through seven. Uh, the end of the chapter, the zombie infection has officially spread. Uh, the outbreak has occurred, and there's no stopping it. All Clark and his wife can hope to do now is survive. Um, so, what do you think is going to happen next? Where, how do you think Monica and Clark are going to survive? Where will they go? And what could possibly happen next? So leave those comments down below telling me what you think is going to happen. If you're listening to this on the podcast, thank you for listening. Please subscribe to the podcast if you haven't done so. Feel free to leave comments or reviews. Uh, telling me what you'd like to see or hear next on here. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like this video, comment on it, favorite it, and share it. And please subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Uh, follow all the links down below for uh, all the latest on my life, pretty much. All my social networking links and stuff. And I will talk to you guys tomorrow. Alright? This is author Anthony Avina, signing off. Peace out, guys.